welcome back everybody we get a couple minutes to get some people in here good morning welcome back guys so excited to have you one of my favorite topics today and that is uh the government of ancient rome or the rise of the republic good morning kyle how are you buddy Good morning, Veril. We got some people joining now. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back. I'm so excited to have you guys today. We got a really cool conversation to talk about today. And it's really going to set us up for um, another fun one tomorrow. Or uh, Thursday, sorry. We're going to take this fun one Thursday. Guys, we're gonna get started here in about a few minutes. Uh, excited to have you back. This is gonna be a fun lesson. All right, Jazzy. Good morning, Talon. Good morning. I am doing well. Good morning, Madison. All right, we're starting to get a, a big group in here. Let's keep waiting a few more seconds while we get a few more people joining us. Not to fear, Professor Shire is also here with us this morning. Two more minutes and we'll get started. Two more minutes and we'll get started. Some more people joining. All right.
Good morning, Faith. I think I've said hello to everybody so far, but run back through it. Good morning, Faith, Jazzy, Talon, Kyle, Madison, Kylie, Veryl, and Kyle again. Good morning, guys. Can't wait to get started. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to do it now. Jumping in. Here we go. All right. So today we are talking about the rise of the Roman Republic. And this is a really cool uh, lesson because we're going to talk about their government, how it worked, how that applies to our government today. But we're also going to take a look at what leads up to the Punic Wars, which we'll get to look at battles again. You guys will look at uh, making another battle as well on a sand table. Um, so that project's coming back up again. And this is a really, really fun one. Um, you guys had your practice doing that, and now we're going to really get into it. But here we go. Good morning, Graham. All right. Let's check it out. So welcome back to the Roman Republic. Last week we left off with the fall of the Seven Kings. So we talked about our Seven Kings. Then we talked about Tarquin and the fall of the monarchy. Today we're going to begin the study of the rise of the Republic and its government. So my agenda for the day is we are currently in our welcome. Uh, we're going to go over our expectation standard essential question and objectives. Then we're going to talk about the Roman Republic for 15 to 20 minutes. We're going to look ahead and see what's coming up. We're going to have some questions, and I'm going to end with some closing announcements, and then we'll move on from there. So my expectations for today are that you take notes, that you ask questions, because questions help us seek a deeper knowledge of our topic. You're going to make connections to previous lessons and civilizations. You're going to learn something new, and you're going to have fun. Our standard is standard number three, recognize significant events, figures, and contributions of classical civilizations like Phoenicia, Greece, Rome, and Axum. Your objective is I can describe the function of early democracies such as the Roman Republic. And our essential questions, how did the Roman Republic work? So we're gonna figure out how those things came to work together and that's our question that we really want to figure out is how did it work? And then was the Roman Republic effective at ruling ancient Rome? We're going to ask ourselves, was it truly a democracy? Did everybody truly have a voice? Was it successful or, or was it just pure anarchy or craziness? And that's a good question that we need to ask ourselves. Is, does Rome serve its purpose? Does the government of Rome serve its purpose? So, let's dive in. First thing I'd like for you guys to do is repeat this with me. Senatus populus que Romanus. Senatus populus que Romanus. Senatus populus que Romanus. Senatus populus que Romanus. What we are saying is the Senate and the people of Rome. The Senate and the people of Rome. You see, Rome no longer has a king. They got rid of it. So now who rules Rome? The Senate and the people of Rome. Senatus populus que Romano. So it's the Senatus, the Senate, populus, the people. You can see how those words are pretty similar. K with ro Rome. Okay. So the QA there is saying the Senate with the people of Rome rule. All right? The rule is implied. They don't actually put the rule ruled out. They put the word ruled out. But they're implying that. And it's funny because Latin is such a strange language sometimes. They really didn't have spaces. It's a very old language. And so sometimes this a sentence like this would all be scrunched together. And it looks kind of goofy to us today. Uh, but that's just how Latin is sometimes written. So... If you ever study Latin, Latin, sometimes you'll find out that the words are scrunched in together and you have to find where the break should be, even though sometimes words are smell, uh, spelled very similarly. You have to use all the words in context to figure out what the sentence is saying. So sometimes Latin can take a while to read. Uh, but it's a very important saying and something that you guys should remember. Sonotus populus que Romanus, the Senate with the people of Rome. S-P-Q-R. Like the front 
of the or like the title of this video, SPQR, Sinatus Populus Quae Romanus, it directly stands for the Roman Republic. In 509 BC, the Roman monarchy, the Roman kings, a monarchy means king, uh, was overthrown by the people of Rome. The power of governing now transferred from the king to the free citizens of the Roman Empire. This transfer of power to the people was the birth of democracy in Rome. The Republic was born. So, with the downfall of the monarchy, now we're going to see the rise of the Roman Republic. And we're going to see the power to rule is going to be instilled with the people that are being ruled. It's not going to stay just with the king anymore. It's moving on from there. So again, SPQR. You can say it with me one more time. Senatus Populus Quae Romano. The Senate and the people of Rome. Senatus Populus Quae Romanus. The Senate and the people of Rome. This is the symbol for the Roman Republic. Uh, it is the eagle with the laurel, the crown of uh, of laurels. All right, so that that plant that is around the eagle, that is the symbol of leadership that is worn by Senate members. This is worn by consuls. They put that in their hair. It means a uh, great legacy. All right, and then underneath that is a bundle of sticks wrapped around an axe, and I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But that is the symbol of the Roman Republic. Roman citizens. Who was a full Roman citizen? All right. So only free Roman men could be considered citizens. Men had to serve in the military and vote in elections. So we talk about it's a right to vote. We talk about it's a right to uh, participate in our government in the United States today. It's not just a right in ancient Rome, it's a duty that's required. So if you are a Roman citizen, if you are a male Roman, if you're a free male Roman, you have to vote. You have to serve in the military. There is no right. It's your right to do it, but it is also required that you do it, all right? It's like for boys that are 18, if, guys, if you're in this class, when you turn 18, you have to sign up for the draft. Does that mean you're going to get drafted? Probably not, ever, all right? We pretty much don't do that anymore. But you are going to be required to sign up. It's your right to serve, but you're also required to sign up. In ancient Rome, you had to sign up for the military. And you had to vote. Those were two very important things. Now, Roman women had a limited form of citizenship. They could not vote or hold public office. Sorry, ladies. They couldn't do either of those two things. But they could own their own property and engage in business. So already they have a leg up from about everybody else in the ancient world when it came to women. They can own their own property and engage in business. That's right, women. You could be rich in ancient Rome and you could be okay doing it. You could also obtain a divorce in the ancient Rome. Um, marriage was not for life in the Roman Empire. If you didn't like your spouse, if you didn't like your husband, if you didn't like your wife, you could seek a divorce. And that was perfectly legal and would be obtained in court. And that was something that women had the right to do. Uh, slaves were considered property and therefore they had no rights. Uh, former slaves, however, we call these people the freedmen, could gain citizenship, but they could not vote. However, because they were freemen, their children became Roman citizens and they could vote. So if a slave earns his freedom, maybe he's a gladiator, he's a slave, uh, he's able to fight for his freedom, he, he receives his freedom, he can then, uh, his children can then become free. All right? His children can then become uh, Roman citizens and vote when they need to. So... It's quite a um, interesting path to citizenship, but it's one that is accomplished. All right. So, uh, yes, women, I understand you're excited. Girls, you're excited that you have a right to vote. Uh, Roman men, guys, I know you got the world on your shoulders here. You got to vote. You got to serve in the military. The slaves. Uh, there were a lot of Roman. There are a lot of slaves that the Romans kept from all over the Mediterranean. 
It didn't matter what color you were. You could be a slave in the Roman Empire. Even Roman citizens could be slaves if they fell into debt. We'll talk about that a little bit later. All right. Um, but slaves could earn their own freedom, which was a possibility that you don't really see too often. Good morning, Chris. It was actually very common that slaves would find a way to earn their freedom in ancient Rome. All right. This is just a picture of what Roman citizens look like. To be a Roman citizen uh, meant a couple very important things. To be a Roman citizen meant that you wore a toga. So all four of these guys are wearing togas. Your more common togas are just white. Uh, if you have a green toga, that doesn't mean that much. But if you have a, um, a toga with a red stripe in it, and I'll show you a picture of that later on, that meant that you were very important. But wearing a toga was a sign of being a Roman citizen, all right? If you wore that toga, it meant you were a Roman citizen. Good morning, Jordan. Good morning, Chris. So let's talk about rights. Roman citizens enjoyed more rights than just voting. So again, what's a Roman citizen? It is a male Roman, all right? It is a male Roman. So they enjoyed more rights than just voting. They had the right to a trial, just like you do today. You have a right to free trial. That's part of being a U.S. citizen is you have a right to a trial, all right? Um, and, in fact, they have to charge you within uh, 24 hours of your arrest. Same thing here. They had a right to a trial. In fact, all Roman men were allowed a trial in Rome if convicted of any crime. So if they're convicted of a crime and they think they're going to receive better judgment, they can have their trial moved to the city of Rome to be heard there. Roman citizens were all equal in the eyes of the law. So it didn't matter if you're a plebe. It didn't matter if you're a partition. It didn't matter if you were the consul. You could all go to court together. All right? So as long as you're a Roman citizen, as long as you're a Roman male, you have the right uh, or you're considered to be a equal in the eye of the law, which meant they weren't allowed to torture you. They weren't allowed to beat you. You couldn't be whipped uh, for, without a trial. Okay? So you couldn't be tortured without a trial. You couldn't be abused without a trial. They had to go to court. Roman citizens were immune from taxes and other obligations. So if you're a Roman citizen and you're living in another country and they try to tax you, technically you are free from that tax. So if you lived in somewhere like Israel and you're a Roman citizen and they try to tax you, you could say, nope, you can't do that. I'm a Roman citizen. And then finally, the law of loose gentium. Um, this is a very interesting term, and we're not going to get too much into it. Uh, but what loose gentium means is it's international law. And that protected Roman citizens to unfair and unjust laws of other countries. So, give you an example. We all live in the United States. If Germany passes a law that says if you have uh, blonde hair, all right, we'll give it, or actually here's a better one. If your name is Jordan Moody, you have to go to jail for um, five years. Or if your name is Kyle, you get a free puppy. Or if your name is Dianara, um, you can have to do um, the Dougie in the town square every day uh, for one hour. All right. So Les Gentium says if we consider it to be an unjust law, then it does not apply to you. All right. So if I look at that law and I say it is unjust that Faith has to go to jail because she has blonde hair. It's unjust that Dianara has to do the Dougie or Jordan has to go to jail for five years. Uh, it is just that Kyle deserves a puppy so he can have a puppy. All right. So Les Gentium says if there's a law and we consider it to be unjust, it does not apply to Roman citizens. All right. So any law anywhere in the world, the Romans said, if it did not apply to us, we therefore do not, if it is unjust, we don't have to follow it. So it's quite a powerful law saying that Rome has power over the rest of the world. It's actually the first idea that people have individual rights, that there are human rights, right? Uh, we believe that there are human rights that you, you should have, of these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right, that's an American statement by one of our founding father, fathers. He's referring exactly to Les Gentium. All right, 
you have irrefutable rights. Among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Les Gympion provided the background for that. All right? If there's a law, it's unjust. You have rights as a human being, being who you are. All right? So, Graham, just because you are who you are, that law doesn't apply to you because it's unjust and unfair. You, as a Roman citizen, will not have to follow it, and we will fight for you. That's what ancient Rome was saying. That's what the Republic was saying. So it's kind of a really cool concept, but uh, it's the foundation of very important laws that will come into the United States. And again, the rights of the Romans really do influence our founding fathers, and I'll talk about that more later. All right. Roman citizens had to have a trial. So the government. The Roman government was made up of Senate members or senators and magistrates, and we're going to break those down. A magistrate is a civil officer or lay judge who administers the law. So a magistrate is a very important senator. It's a senator that has been um, selected to be, or uh, has been selected or appointed or um, voted in by the Senate to serve in a specific role, okay? The Roman government is made up of senators. The senators are the people that vote. There were three, started out with 100, then it went to 300, and then it went to 600, 900, and back to 600. Uh, so it jumps around a lot throughout the history of Rome. Okay, So a magistrate is a senator who's been elected to an office uh, of lay judge or civil officer, and they administer the law. Okay, So they may make sure that you're doing business correctly, that your uh, weights and scales are correct, or they may be judges in a court case. All right, so it's a pretty serious job, and let me go over some of the magistrates. So, there's six types of magistrates, the dictator, the consul, the praetor, the censor, the um, curel adeli, and the quester. The quester dealt mainly with money and business practices. The cru, uh, curel uh, adeli dealt with um, law. The praetor also dealt with law, and the censor dealt with making sure that people weren't cheating each other in business. So, um, these different roles. Originally, you only start out with two, and we'll explain that later. Uh, but those are the positions. We're not going to get too much in depth there. Um, this is the Roman Republic. Uh, this is a Senate House where people would be voting. So, the Senators. So, let's talk about who these Senators are. The Romans used the name Senatus for their most important seat of government which derives from Senex meaning old, and meant assembly of old men, with a connotation of wisdom and experience. So, um, <laughs> literally, the Senate means house of old men, alright? Uh, assembly of old men. Now, they weren't all that old. You could be a senator at quite a young age. Um, it didn't necessarily admit you were an old man, but it's just a, a, a statement that say these guys are wise, these guys uh, have experience, and they have the right to rule. They're wise, and they have experience. Hi, good morning, uh, Sam. All right, so Roman senators were chosen from elite families, and most senators kept that role for life. All right, so you would be selected uh, as you get a little bit older, and you would retain that role for the rest of your life. It was a role that you kept, and you never really stepped down from. Um, senators wore white togas, but they had a purple stripe, to show their elevated position in Rome. So a purple stripe went down their toga, and it showed that everyone that they were a senator. Uh, the Roman senators also got nice seating at events. So if they went to a festival or a circus or uh, a religious event or a play or a gladiatorial match, they always got the best seat in the house or one of the best seats in the house. Um, senators, uh, a senator's most important role was to vote for the consul and other magistrates. All right. So their most important role was to vote. Now, um, one of the interesting things about senators is that they weren't allowed to leave Rome except if they got permission. So they could leave if they got permission from the Senate, but they had to get permission. The Romans were kind of afraid they were going to go off and start their own little um, their own little kingdom, or they may get kidnapped, and then they had to ransom them back. So to keep them out, they'd say, you got to stay inside Rome or you got to stay inside the, the territory of Rome you can't leave without permission uh, one of the things they did the senators also served as generals or, or lieutenants in the military so they had very important military roles as well um, it was all about clout and what I mean by that is if you ever noticed a celebrity they do a lot of stuff on they do a lot of stuff on TikTok or they do a lot of stuff 
on Twitter or Facebook, and they post and they try to get people to make the like it or uh, or get uh, more famous off of their social media, right? They do things to get famous off social media. You guys have seen it. I know all of you have TikTok. Um, they want to attract attention with those platforms. Well, the senators actually had something very similar. Now, they didn't have social media. They didn't have a phone to pull out and tweet out stuff. But they did things to get recognition. They'd go off to war. They'd try to win a great victory. They would do something noble. Sometimes they'd do something that wasn't noble. Um, they'd get in a scandal and get caught. So they were trying to get attention no matter which way it was. And sometimes that elevated that position. Sometimes it weakened their position. So as long as they could elevate themselves, that was the goal. They wanted their name to be on everybody's lips. They wanted people to think about who they were and what they did. And that's how they got notoriety. And that was very important to a Roman senator. Because the more famous you are, the more likely it is that someone is going to notice you and that someone is going to vote for you for a position. All right, here are Roman senators. You can see that they are wearing the white toga with the red stripes. You can see that it goes around their hem. It also is vertical on their chest. All right, you can see it very well in the guy to the left. All right, um, so this would have been the Roman Senate house. The guy in the middle is the consul, all right? The guy in the middle that has that red kind of, um, of carpet, that is the consul. We'll talk about that position here in a minute. And then the person talking is what we call the orator or the senator that's allowed to speak, he's right there. Hey, Sam, we're not playing around in the comment bar. Thank you. All right, the dictator. The dictator was a very special position in the room. The dictator was a senator who was elected in times of war or emergency to a position of absolute power. Dictators were charged with solving the emergency, pro uh, emergency as quickly as possible with full power to command Roman troops. Dictators had only six months to solve the problem. As soon as they accomplished their task, they were to resign their office. So, it's an incredibly important position. In times of extreme disaster, they were charged with quickly organizing a resistance or an army and solving the problem. They only had six months to do it. All right? And they were expected that as soon as they got done fixing the problem, they had to quit. All right? So it was in time of greatest despair if you guys remember back to star wars you remember that emperor palpatine originally came to power as a senator palpatine they, they gave them emergency powers to fight in the rogue war chancellor palpatine was given powers to fight in the rogue war they stole that directly from here okay they stole that directly from the idea of the dictator the dictator is a very special position it's only called in in times of desperate struggle, all right? And one of the most famous of them all was a guy named Cincinnatus, all right? Cincinnatus here is the one wearing, who has the walking stick, all right? So Cincinnatus was a Roman senator, and he was working at his farm one day. Romans very much cared about the agricultural world. They very much cared about their farms. And most Roman aristocracy, most people that were rich in Rome, had a farm outside the city. They didn't really live in a city. They lived outside the city. Uh, they did that on purpose. Rome could be kind of smelly. Um, and so he gets called by these two men, these two men wearing white. These were senators and consuls at the time. They came to Cincinnati and they said, hey, um, we need to make you the dictator. We really need help right now. The Roman Empire is in, or the Roman Republic's in peril. We are getting invaded. And Cincinnati said, all right, hold on. And he sends for his wife. And his wife brings back his toga. And you can see them carrying that red toga right there. That is the, ro the toga of the dictator. And so they put that on him, and he becomes the dictator of Rome. Now, it's common practice at that point to have a big parade, to celebrate, to get ready to go to war. Not Cincinnati. He immediately appoints his second-in-command gathers an army, makes every man who is of military age get their stuff and form up. He takes a massive army out of the city of Rome, marches into battle, wins the battle, and in 16 days, all right? So he marches out to battle, he wins the battle, in 16 days he has done everything he needs to do. He immediately marches the army back to uh, the river, 
There's a river outside of Rome, and we'll talk about that later. The, we call it the Lubricol. He immediately uh, tells everyone to go home, so you can't march your army across that. It's just a rule. We'll talk about that later when we get to Julius Caesar. His army disbands. He takes off that, that road. He puts back on his toga and goes back to work on the farm. All right? He has all the power in the world, guys. He could have made himself the king. Nobody would have said anything because he was, one, he was victorious. Two, he was the dictator. Three, the men trusted him and loved him. He won a great victory. He got them rich. But he didn't take a penny from the, the enemy's money. All he did was do his job and return home to his farm. Cincinnati. He is what we call the citizen soldier. All right? He is a citizen, and in times of need, he's a soldier. And he was perfect at it. He'd actually do it another time. He got elected the dictator again. And he quickly solved the problem again and went back to his farm. So twice he had all the power of the Roman Republic in his hands. And twice he turned it away. All right? Twice he said, all right, I'm going to get the job done because that is my duty. Right? I'm being called to do this. It is my duty. And as soon as he was done, he said, it is time to move on and get back to the farm. So one of my favorite characters in history um, honestly, there's there's an award, there's wards for the Cincinnati Award. The city of Cincinnati is named after this guy. Um, it is quite a remarkable person, quite a remarkable story. Okay, real quick, because I know I told you guys I would talk about this. If you look uh, behind the consoles, the consoles are again wearing white, and no, those are not dresses, they're called togas. Um, if you look behind that guy, what you're going to see is there's a guy in green. All right, he's got like green stockings on and a green toga on. All right, over his shoulder, you're going to see what looks like an axe. All right, it's a bundle of sticks with an axe, and I'll give you a better picture of it. All right, the eagle is standing on top of it in this picture, uh, the bundle of sticks and the axe. Okay, so what that is, is that is a sign of the consul. Uh, and one of the official jobs of the consul is to be a judge. So if he shows up and he has to judge something, He's got a couple options here, and, and this showed their power. Uh, one, if you were found guilty of a crime, he would actually have you beaten. And so they would unbundle that, that, uh, that bundle of sticks, and everyone would get a stick and they'd beat you. Okay, So they'd get people to, um, to do that. Or, if you were a really bad person and you deserve to die, and, and when I say very bad person, if you just committed a small crime in Rome, it could be punishable by death. The... Uh, they carried with them an axe, so the execution could be carried out immediately, all right? So it's either uh, a beating or cutting off the head. Those were two of the possibilities that they could have um, with that, all right? Okay, so that's the dictator. Very, very, very important that you guys remember that. And uh, the one that we want to remember is a guy by the name of Cincinnatus, the perfect example of a citizen soldier. All right, the consul. The consul was the highest elected position that a senator could claim in times of peace. So, unlike the dictator, a consul was a very normal position. Dictators only happened every now and then. Consuls uh, happened every single year. They were elected every single year, um, and they could serve for one-year terms. All right. So, the consul was elected. They were only allowed to serve for one year in that position before they had to give it up. Now, they could come back and serve there again, but they couldn't serve repetitive uh, so you couldn't win re-election, okay? Basically, you'd serve, you'd be done for a year, then you'd come back and you'd serve again. Um, Rome always had two consuls to prevent one from taking too much control over the government. So there was two of them. Two consuls got elected. And they had something called a system of checks and balances. So each consul, um, they would alternate who, was re who had to go to the Senate meetings and who had to, to listen to stuff and who was really in charge. They would alternate that every month. So they would each serve like six months as the, the, the head of the Senate. Uh, both consuls had the power to veto. So I'm sure some of you know what veto means. Uh, literally, it's translated to I reject. All right. Um, it means that they have the power to say no to a law. So if a law gets passed, they can look at it and say, I veto that. It's a presidential power that our president has today. So if a law is passed in the House of Congress and in the Senate, the president can look at it and say, mm, I veto that law. 
Typically, the power of the veto is used uh, in the president's second term. They use it a lot if they know they're going out and they have a Congress that doesn't like them. They'll veto a bunch of the laws that the Congress tries to pass um, kind of as a way to uh, make sure that their legacy stays together. Um, President Obama exercised that one a lot when the Republicans took both the House and the Senate in 2000 and uh, and. For, uh, been, uh, 14, they took over the House and the Senate, all right, and so he used that a lot to veto any bills that they tried to pass that he didn't like. Um, now, you can overrule the veto, it just doesn't happen very often. So each consul could veto what the veto what the other consul was doing, and consuls serve as the highest ranking military officers, judges, administrators, and legislators in Rome. So they were in charge of the military, they are in charge of being of the courts, they were in charge of the laws, and they were in charge of making sure the country ran. All right, here are two consuls sitting side by side, so you can see them sitting side by side, passing out rules. They wore that red to show they were the consul. So the whole red cover um, shows that they're a consul. If they just had a white one, like you saw on the other guys, that means they are a, um, a senator. But when they put on the red, they become the consul. All right, so all wasn't hunky and dory. Um, in the early days of the Republic, the plebeians, remember we had two groups in ancient Rome, the plebeians were very poor and had very little voice in Roman politics. So the plebeians, the, the poor class, had no voice. Um, and the plebeians were never appointed as senators and therefore could not be elected as magistrates. So they were never allowed to be senators. Um, it was only a patrician job. Only patricians could be uh, senators. But in 494, the plebeians said, you know what, forget that. We have to fight for these guys. We have to die for these guys. They're passing unjust laws. And so they left Rome in mass. In mass, E-N-M-A-S-S-E, -S -S -E, means they left as a big group of people in mass, all right? So if all of you in sixth grade got up and left class, you would have left in mass. And the Senate sent out uh, Agrippa Minius uh, Linatus to the plebeians, and they really liked this guy. Uh, Minianus was a great general. And he convinced the plebeians to return to Rome in exchange for a voice in the Senate. Um, from this, the position of tribune was born, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Why were the plebeians so mad? Well, here's a couple things. Uh, the plebeians were so mad because um, they had no land prop, they had no land. They could easily go into debt, and they would borrow money from people. There were lots of people who loaned them money. But if you borrowed money and you couldn't pay it back, you could become a slave. And so... Roman, uh, so Roman citizens, Roman plebeians, were getting into debt, and they're ending up as slaves to the patricians. And so um, that was one of the big issues, is they were tired of seeing plebeians, uh, Roman citizens, becoming slaves. And number two, they served in the military, and they weren't getting the recognition or the reward from serving. And that really, really angered them. And here's a problem. If everybody in Rome serves in the military and the majority of the people have their weapons and are angry at the ruling class, they can easily revolt and kill people, all right? They'll revolt in the street. They're trained to fight, all right? This isn't just some, re some unruly mob. This is an unruly mob that knows what to do, all right? They fought wars for Rome there for 20 years or for 10 years. They know what to do. So it's not wise to anger these people. All right. So the Roman Senate has to say, hey, look, let's, uh, let's give something to the plebeians. All right. This is Midius coming to talk to the plebeians. And his analogy that he gave them is uh, one that's actually very similar to something that, that Jesus would, would end up saying in the Bible. What he said is uh, the, limbs, uh, the limbs and the belly have to work together. All right, the limbs are going to starve without the belly. Right, the belly is where food's digested and where energy goes from the stomach to the arms to work. You guys learned about that in the muscular system this week. So he's saying, look, we the patricians are the belly. All right, we are the center of Rome. We provide government. We provide um, all of the authority and power in the city. We provide the structure. We provide all of the food. Okay, remember, the partitions are the farmers. And you, the plebeians, you are the limbs. You work together to make sure we function. You fight in the wars. You, uh, you work the fields for us. You work in the city. 
we have to work together, otherwise we're all going to die, right? The belly doesn't get fed by the limbs, it's going to die. The limbs don't get fed by the belly, it's going to die, all right? So he's saying, look, the city's not going to exist if we all fight against each other. We have to work together to be successful. And it's quite a powerful speech that, uh, that Minius is able to give and convince the plebeians of. So they create a position called the Tribune of the Plebes. The Tribunes were only elected from the Plebes. The only Plebes could be a Tribune. And like the Consul, the Tribunes were elected for one-year periods, and two Tribunes served at the same time to limit their power. So just like the Consul, we have two Tribunes serving at the same time. Tribunes had the power of veto, and their main responsibility was to protect the Plebes from unfavorable laws and judgments. So following this revolt, uh, a couple major things happened. One, they got the Tribune of the Plebes. Two, they got their own kind of Senate house. They called that the Assembly, where the Tribune kind of ran things. Three, they were no longer allowed to be debt, uh, to go into debt enough to be slaves. So they got rid of that. Um, it also meant that they wouldn't, couldn't borrow money anymore. But they couldn't be uh, debted into slavery. And uh, four, eventually they'd get the right to marry. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So, the word of the day, and I don't know if you saw that, get ready for it, you're going to see something flash on the screen, is Tribunes of the Plumes, alright, look, it's underlined, it's now green, it is the word of the day, I don't want to hear from anybody, I can't find the magic word, because it's green and underlined, alright, it's green and underlined, I don't want to hear it from anybody. Word of the day, Tribune of the Plebes. All right, I'm sorry, Tribune. Using his power to veto. He doesn't use that very often. Um, there's not many instances where the Tribune of the Plebes actually used his veto, but um, he had the ability to do it. All right, the law. In 451 BC, we're almost done, guys, so pay, pay attention, stay with me. In 451 BC, 10 Roman senators sat down and created a set of laws. The laws were named the Twelve Tables and became the basis for all Roman laws. The Twelve Tables are so influential that almost every code of law in the world today are based off them. Alright, let's go over that again. In 451, ten senators sat down. Alright, um, they actually used a word that says ten men. Alright, literally that's how they announced this group. They sat down and they created a set of laws. The laws were named the Twelve Tables and became the basis for all Roman laws. The Twelve Tables are so influential that they that almost every code of law in the world today are based off of them. All right, pretty powerful stuff. They were posted in the forum where everybody could see them. So these are guys looking at the Twelve Tables, who are the uh, brass uh, or bronze panes right there. So, what are they actually saying to us? Well, Table 1 was a procedure for courts and trials. So, it basically said that all Romans have a right to go to trial. Uh, table 2 talked about threat, theft and trials. So, Table 2 was like, hey, if you steal something from somebody, um, this is how you're going to go to jail. They actually had some weird laws. One of them was, if someone breaks into your house at night, whether they're armed or not armed, you're allowed to kill them. Okay. So if they break into your house at night, whether they're armed or not armed, you can kill them. If they break into your house during the day and they are armed, you can kill them. But if they're not armed, they don't have a, um, like a weapon, you got to gather a group of people and then arrest them. All right? So a little weird there, right? If they break in at night with a weapon or without a weapon, you can kill them. But if they break in the day, they have to have a weapon in order for you to kill them. If they don't have a weapon, you have to get a bunch of people and go chase after them. It's weird. It's really weird. Uh, table three dealt with debt. Uh, with debt, um, it basically said you can't become a slave because you're in debt. Table number four said the rights of fathers. The fathers have rights over the family. So um, the the father was in charge of the, the Roman family in very important role. Um, it was the oldest male. Uh, the father. He's very very important role. And so it was a, such a big crime. So if you killed the father, right, um, you get really mad at your dad, you end up killing him. They had a pretty weird punishment for it. They would take you 
and they'd put you in a big sack, and then they'd put a rooster, and a snake, and a monkey. Yeah, rooster, snake, monkey, and you, all into a sack, and they'd close up the sack, and they'd throw it in the Tiber River. Um, and then I guess it's a fight to see who gets out. Really weird punishment, really weird death. Um, don't mess with the father, all right? He has a right to even sell his children, all right? In the Roman Republic, the father had the right to sell his own children into slavery. There is a really cool law on that one. Um, the father could sell you into slavery and buy you back. And then if he does that again, sells you into slavery and, slavery and buys you back. And then he does that one more time. He sells you into slavery and buys you back. At that point, you can say, I don't want this guy to be my father anymore. Okay? So he can sell you into slavery and buy you back three times before you're able to say, hey, this guy's not so nice. I don't want to have to live with him anymore. Three times, guys. Three times. Again, fascinating stuff. Fable 5, estates and legal guardianship. Um, table 6, ownership and possession. Uh, table 7, crimes and land rights. So, um, again, it's a lot of stuff dealing with farming. A lot of these tables have a lot to do with farming. So it's like, hey, what happens if a tree on my property uh, drops its fruit on, let's say, um, paint near the next to join? So let's say my tree drops an apple on your property. And let's say one of your animals, say you have a pig and it comes over and eats the apple, uh, who's, at, who's at fault there? So um, you may have to pay me money if that happens. Those are some of the, the crimes and land rights. Uh, laws of injury, say you hurt somebody, you're allowed to sue. In ancient Rome, you can sue people. So if you slip and fall, yes, there are even slip and fall lawyers in ancient Rome. Uh, so some of these guys that we have here locally... Um, Oh, gosh, who do we have? Think about them. Uh, who are some of these law cut firms that we have in Jacksonville? You hear their commercials all the time. Um, I'm not thinking of anybody right now. I don't know why I can't think of somebody. Um, but I'm sure you guys know a bunch of them in the top of your head. All these lawyers that work together. Yeah, those guys work together, and they are injury lawyers. Guys, they had that in ancient room. Then there's public law, sacred law, sacred law dealing with religion. Um, public law dealing with public people. Table uh, 11 and Table 12 um, didn't actually have uh, anything written on them. They were actually left open for things to be written. And so they wrote in marriages between classes. Um, so what that means is before partitions and plebeians could get married, no matter which way they went, partitions had to marry partitions, plebeians had to fair and fair, very good barrel, and plebeians had to marry plebeians, very, very good. All right. So um, the marriage between classes allowed that other that the classes could marry each other. This was something that came later on in the Republic following the plebeian revolt. So they left room on their tables so that they could add new stuff and then binding into law, meaning how does something, uh, how do you create a new law? Binding into law was a law specific to how to create new laws. So all of these laws would end up coming on to influence the United States today. Guys, we have laws about debt. We have laws about threats and trials. Uh, we have laws on procedure for how our courts operate. We have laws about the family. We have laws about estates and legal guardianship. Guys, we got laws on every one of these 12 things and many, many more. This is the foundation for our law system today. All right? This is it. And pretty much everywhere else in the world. Pretty cool stuff. All right. For most of the history of the Republic, we see the conflict between the Roman classes Partitions controlled most of the land and power, while the plebes tended to be poor and had little opportunity to climb the social ladder. Over time, plebes gained more rights. Eventually, plebes gained the right to serve as senators, uh, minor magistrates, and even consuls. Even with these gains, very few plebes ever made it to elevated positions of a senator. So, uh, while they could become senators, most of the time that was reserved for a certain family inside the plebes. Only a certain few families were ever in the plebes ever made it to senator. And they pretty much kept that power forever. Um, Octavian's family was one of these families. We'll talk about C uh, Caesar Augustus later um, in a few weeks. He was one of the few. Morgan and Morgan, very good faith. And yes, they're for the people. Very good faith. All right. So, guys, that is going to end it for um, our bit of our lecture. Real quick, I want to talk about things that are coming up. Uh, 
so right here we are uh, talking about looking ahead um, so guys what we're looking ahead is on uh, tomorrow on uh, on Thursday I want to show you guys the Punic Wars we're actually gonna watch a battle between Hannibal and the Romans um, it's a in kind of an me interesting medium we're gonna use the game Rome Total War so I can show you guys what it would look like on the battlefield at the time and how Hannibal so expertly defeated the Romans and how the Romans would eventually come back to be Hannibal and create uh, Hera and Hera, very good. Um, would end up, to, it's Fair and Thera, I think, pretty sure. Um, Peyton. And, and how they would come back to, uh, to establish the Republic. So, right now, uh, questions, guys. Any questions before we move on to our closing announcements? Give you guys a couple seconds on that. Any questions? Oops. Any questions? Peyton answering for everybody. There are no questions. Um, if they are, they'll come out in my live session here in a few minutes. So, closing announcements. All right, guys. So, um, things coming ahead and, and closing announcements. So, we're going to have a project coming up in a few days. We're also going to have a Rome day. Uh, we're going to wait until I, I, I spoke with the other, the other uh, sixth grade teachers. We're going to have that probably next week. We're going to have our Rome day. Uh, sometime next week. We're still working on that out for you guys. But basically, we're going to have a scavenger hunt. So what you're going to do is you're going to get with your parents, you're going to jump in the car, and you're going to travel around Jacksonville, and you're going to try to find a few things and take pictures with them. Uh, there's going to be some goofy things that you're going to have to do. There's going to be some fun things you got to do. There's one's going to be you're going to have to eat ice cream. Uh, so I'm going to make you find ice cream or Italian ice. I haven't decided yet. And you got to eat it on camera um so i'm gonna have some cool assignments for you guys i really i'm really looking forward to doing that and then showing you guys the battles of the punic war so uh those are my closing announcements for today uh, other than that i want you guys to have a great day there will be a formative up before 10 o'clock uh, again i'm going to put that up on the i'm going to put link it in microsoft teams so you guys can easily get there uh, with this video all right guys i hope you enjoyed today i really found it interesting i hope you did as well um, and learned a little bit and hopefully this helps benefit you uh, next year as you prepare to go to civics all right guys it's been a joy it's been a passion um, and I will talk to you guys later I'm gonna be back on from 1 to 2 today I'm also gonna be on uh, right around 9 o'clock to do my live session with you for 30 minutes all right guys have a great day see ya